welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with uh, Dan Harvey and Jim Riggio. Today we're going to be going over the round trip or the road trip trade. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer though, the Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. So with that out of the way, let me um, close this and go back to PowerPoint. So hopefully you can see that. Yeah. That was a good picture, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, it also shows about, our age. Oh, yeah. It also shows our <laughs> age, 3W buses. <laughs> My dad had one of these a long time ago. Okay, so uh, the road trip trade uh, created by Dan Harvey, and uh, I, I put these slides together. We just went over the disclaimer. Um, again, thank you, Dan. Um, a lot of people have already benefited from this trade, so can't thank you enough. I know there's uh, a lot of people appreciate your sharing this, and you know, this is just kind of a formula, formally presenting it for people to have it all in one place. But thanks again for uh, getting the ball started on this trade. Well, you bet. Okay, so quick overview of the trade. Um, some trade goals, design, guidelines, and then we'll go through some examples. So the goals, obviously we want to preserve capital and uh, the road trip trade it starts out, you know, 75 days to expiration, so it, it, the gamma is very low. So uh, it's very uh, capable of, of handling big market moves up and down. Um, it's delta neutral, a very, very low gamma. Typically, when I put these on, gamma is maybe 0.01 or 2. And uh, normal exit, 10 to 14 days to expiration. Um, another priority is a uh, few and simple adjustments, so we don't want to uh, have to babysit this trade a lot so we can hit the road. Um, so basically just monitor the trade for, for uh, large moves down during the first 30 days, like we've had recently. And the timing of the entry and adjustments is not, not so critical, but you do want to put them on down days or neutral days, not known as going up, so volatility is working in your favor. And uh, you can monitor it once per day. It doesn't require a lot of babysitting. Um, the profits are pretty generous on this trade. Uh, 10 to 20% is Dan's target, and uh, I think he hit that most of the time. Um, new trades you can do every two weeks, and you can safely overlap them. And I think, Dan, you have four or five on it right now, don't you? Yeah, I have either five or six on In fact, I just now, this morning, uh, put the March 4 cycle on. So that yes. that's a couple days. Uh, farther out on the the uh, DTE horizon than I usually go, but that makes it cheaper. So I got yeah. this. I got the March four trade on for fifty cents. Oh, that's great. Can't uh, can't argue with that. So those are the goals of the trade. Um, the design is trading SPX, so there's lots of liquidity. It's a put broken wing butterfly. The upper long strike is uh, about at the current SPX price, plus or minus five points. Short strike, 40 points below that, and the lower long is 50 points below the shorts. And a normal window is 70 to 75 days to, to uh, expiration, and on a flat or down day in the market, as we said. So ideal entry price is a dollar or less, and usually trade launch at 75 days is cheaper. As Dan just pointed out, he got some on at 50 cents, so definitely don't pay more than a dollar if you have to. Um, Try to leave the position alone unless SPX has a large move down. And if the move is early in the trade, either exit or add, put debit spreads is the normal way. I have some other ideas and later in the presentation. Just uh, that's up to the trader if they want to try any of those. But um, exiting to me seems like the simplest way. And if later in the trade, exit because you'll probably have a profit. So that's that. Uh, trade guidelines. Uh, plant capital in the John Locke sense is about 8,500. So initially you'll use about 6,500 in margin, and then if you put some put debit spreads on, that'll be probably about 2,000. So 8,500 for your planned capital, but initially you'll probably only see 6,500 in margin. Uh, profit target is $1,200 per six lot, which is a, a nice return. 
We already talked about the days to expiration and the, the structure, the 40, 50 uh, point strikes. And maximum entry price, uh, I know uh, in the trading group too, Dan, you had said a dollar to a dollar 25, but then later you said mo no more than a dollar, but definitely try and get as l uh, low a price as you can, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I will pay a dollar twenty-five, but I would rather just wait another day, uh, frankly, because uh, um, you know usually I can get it a little cheaper. And of course, if you if you go below the seventy-day window, which is still acceptable to be in the sixty-five to seventy-day window, but you probably will uh, pay between a buck and a quarter and a buck fifty at that point. Yeah, so that, that's a, a good reason to put them on earlier rather than later, so they're cheaper. Right, exactly. And so, what if you carry another uh, five days of risk at a a you know using a very very low gamma a type of strategy? I think I think that's inconsequential and negligible risk for that extra five days to get a cheaper price. Right. And then uh, occasionally you said you add a teeny, a trade entry, so like a one or two delta uh, under $2. How often do you do that? Um, well, nearly every time recently. I didn't start to trade that way, but it does tend to smooth it out a little bit. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not absolutely necessary to do that, but I just like to have it on because oh, $2 you know, in the context of, uh, say, a 20% yield is nothing. It's, right. it's uh, you know, hamburger money. Yep. And, uh, again, if in the first 30 days of the trade, leave it alone unless it moves to the lower third of the tent. And if you're at that lower third, either add, put debit spreads uh, or you can to, to lift the downside. And I guess it also depends on how fast it moves down. Yeah. You know, if we get big moves, then... It, I've found it tends to uh, continue that direction. So, um, you know, exiting is always a good idea after big moves if you're not down much. So let's see, after the first 30 days, if the market's more than 30 points above your upper long put, so you're outside the tent on the right, do a reverse Harvey by rolling down the upper longs one at a time to lift that expiration line up to slightly above zero. and leave the trade in play as the market frequently pulls back. So I have this in my example where we raised that right side and I think the profit's about 450, but then the market has a nice 20 point pullback and uh, the, the, the trade ends up making about 750. So if you can give yourself a chance to make more money, you know, leave it on, you don't have to exit right away. Uh, if the position delta reaches 15 to 20, add put debit spreads. Now this is for a six lot, right? Uh, yes. Okay. And this usually occurs near the downside expiration break-even price. Um, now, if you do put the put debit spreads on, you, you don't want to leave them on if the SPX rallies back. So if it gets back to the short strike, um, take it off. And I know there's a good rule of thumb. You taught me is if uh, you put debit spreads on as a hedge and they fall back to 75% of the price that you paid for them, that's also a good rule of thumb to take them off. Right. Okay, so uh, this is important. Once the trade has a, about a 10% profit, start the reverse, har reverse Harvey process to capture more profit and minimize the risk and also flattens out the T plus zero line and makes you less vulnerable to whipsaws. And uh, if SPX is below the tent, um, you, you have to closely monitor your P&L if the price doesn't come back to the tent, it's probably best to close the trade. And like you pointed out, Dan, there's lots of these trades going on every other week. So if you have a small loss now and then, it's not really a big deal. And the normal exit, 10 to 14 days to expiration. If you're near the tent and if SPX is 30 points or more above the upper long put, just let it expire or wait for a nice pullback where you get pushed up above the expiration and you can get out with a little bit extra profit. Okay, so typical trade. So we'll go through just a, a quick trade here. Um, this was a May expiration put on the first week in March. So here's your typical uh, SPX was trading at 2098 and we put on the 2100 longs. 
and Jay's asking how often do you put the trade on? Uh, normally every other week. And then we go 40 points below and then 50 points below that. So this is your typical trade structure. And these are typical Greeks. The gamma, it's only significant to one digit, but it's probably 0.01 or 02. And there's your $6,700 margin. And this is what it looks like. So very little risk on the upside. You know, even if it goes to the moon, you're not going to lose much, and you will reverse Harvey and lift this up anyway. So not really worried about the upside, it's the downside, but you've given yourself a nice flat profit zone to, to work with. And then in option view, it has the, uh, as Dan Sheridan used to call it, the birdie, the, your profit uh, target zone. So that's a, a nice wide area to make a, a profit. So that's a very appealing. So in this trade example, um, 29 days later, so about a month later, uh, we're up about $1,400, which is 21%. And we didn't really have to do anything, because if you look, uh, this is the price range of SPX during that whole period. So really never had anything to worry about, and it's already up about 20%. So Yeah, Tom, I would interject if you could go back to that a, a graph right there. Um, I'm not able to uh, see with, uh, with my ancient eyes the numbers, but if you look at the x-axis and you actually, uh, uh, you know, calculate arithmetically the, the maximum range at which you would make some profit. Uh, uh, usually that's in the 140 to 160 point range from, from the far right where the trade would be st still marginally profitable to the far left where the trade would still be marginally profitable, you know, prior to expiration, of course. And usually that's a, a very broad range, which is another appealing, uh, you know, aspect of this particular strategy, particularly given the large market swings that we've had in recent uh, weeks or days. Yeah, and um, just if you can't read them, this is 1995 and 1984. So, you know, from say about 1990 all the way up to 2120, 2130 range, it's like you said, a very broad range. And um, most of the time it doesn't go anywhere near that wide of swing. So, you know, given the, except for this week, of course, but um, for this 30 day period, it didn't move very much as you can see, which is exactly what you want. So at this point, you want to start looking to protect those profits. So. The reverse Harvey is basically rolling in the longs towards the center strike. So if you're above the tent, you just want to reverse Harvey the upper longs to lift that up that right side. If it's in the tent, then you can reverse Harvey both of the long puts. And I, I had looked at both ways of doing it. You could reverse Harvey um, the same amount for both strikes, or you can actually reverse Harvey the bottom one up 20 points and create a symmetric butterfly. And I'll show you both of these so you can see the difference. So if we reverse Harvey the same, you can see the 2100s to 2090, that's 10 points, we move these down, and then we move the 2010s up 10 to 2020, and that creates our new position here. So we're still at a 30-point upper and 40-point lower butterfly. Um, you can see the margin was reduced a little bit. The vega's reduced, theta's reduced, everything's reduced pretty much. So how does that look? We have... Uh, the, the purple is or violet is before and the blue is the after. So you can see this T plus zero line is much smoother now and uh, we're, we do have a guaranteed profit on the upside of something like, uh, oh, what is that, maybe 1,500? So that's, that's the effect of the uh, reverse Harvey moving both strikes 10 points and it has a nice profit zone. Again, there's guaranteed profit on the upside after that reverse Harvey move. Now, if we do a symmetric butterfly, we would roll up the puts on the downside up 20 points and create a 30-point 30 30 point butterfly. And again, the, the margin is almost zero on this because you've already, you're basically reinvesting your profit in a butterfly. So this is what the trade looks like with a symmetric butterfly. So you do have risks because if it goes out here and you let it expire, you're going to lose your 1,400. So, you know, even if this is above zero, say plus 100, um, you know, it's not a riskless trade. You're basically risking that 1440 that you've already made that you could take off today. 
But, um, you know, look how flat this T plus zero is. It goes way out. And, uh, you know, you're basically playing with the house money at this point. And here's the, uh, the new profit zone for that trade with the symmetric butterfly, which again is very broad. Okay, so if we did the, uh, the original reverse Harvey, so we had, um, let's see, what is it? Had the 20, the 40 point and the 30 point reverse Harvey. Then after a few more days, our, our profit's higher. Now we're up at 30% profit and uh, we're reverse hiring again. So we're pulling in these longs and reducing the margin even more. So that looks like this. So we had the green and now we have the blue. So again, we're lifting this more, we're lifting the whole thing up, reducing the amount of margin and flattening out the T plus zero. Now, Dan, how many times do you reverse Harvey? Just once or do you keep doing it? Uh, well, I usually do it by thirds. So, for example, if I have a six slot, I'll uh, do a two and a two and a two. And uh, by the time I'm up about 30%, which which doesn't happen every time, of course, but it happens often enough, you know, 25 to 30 percent, uh, such as in the example you just now showed. What you have to do then, what is critical, is to really guard that uh, profit that you've already accrued, because now the gamma will be picking up incrementally with every passing day, and you've made money, you have to ask yourself, you know, how are you going to feel if you're up 30% and the market now moves down against you and you wind up taking out only 15%? Um, uh, 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 I mean, that's, that's not good. So uh, no latte for you on that day if you allow that to happen. So I think that's critical to uh, constantly monitor your P and L with whatever uh, software you have. Option View is good. I think that that Option Net Explorer is good. You could do this with a spreadsheet. You know, whatever you want to do, but you always uh, need to keep a good eye on your uh, P and L. And I think, I mean, if you look at this chart, if you let let the SPX get down to your upper strike here then uh, you know, you're not really giving up much. So you can let it wiggle around when you're still trying to get up to this line try to try and squeeze out a little bit more. But like you said, don't let it get down in here and just kill your profit. Right. Okay, so again, what can you do? You can just exit or you can keep staying in and try and squeeze out some more. But like Dan just said, you have to be quick, um, quick to exit if your profits are starting to slip away. So uh, it does require closer monitoring of the trade. And again, you are at risk if the market does uh, another one of these, you know, 50 point moves. So you might even do something like take half of it off, just, you know, play, just reduce the size of the trade and lock in some profits. So there's some ideas you could do. And in this trade, uh, I just kind of went through option view just quickly. The market did continue to rally. And on May 1st with 14 days expiration, the SPX, was at 21.04 roughly, and the profit was 25.50. So it squeezed out a couple hundred extra by just staying in. But you know, you certainly wouldn't be criticized by anybody for exiting with a 30 point or 30 percent gain. Okay, so that's a kind of a typical uh, trade. Let's let's go through a, a a significant move up. And I did see a question about using weekly options. Yes, you do use weekly options. Um, I haven't done it with RUT. Um, SPX has enough liquidity. Have you done these with RUT, Dan? Uh, uh, well, yes, and they will work, but frankly, I like SPX. Uh, the premiums are better. I can get them on more cheaply, and, uh, you know, now I think that RUT only trades on a single exchange, I believe, not like in the old days. So, um, uh, you know, aside from, from having... Uh, well, I'm not even sure it has better liquidity. I, you know, I've done it on RUT a few times, and I just stick with uh, the SPX. I'll do a weird door on the RUT now when things are right, but I'm I'm just doing the road trip on the SPX. Okay, and then I did see a question about. Um, let's see, where was that? Sorry, I got to check. 
Do you have average days in trade? I know you said you like to exit 10 to 14 days, but do you have, like, from your experience trading these over the last few months, how long is a typical trade in? Um, roughly 40 days because sometimes I will begin to tighten up on on both sides of the trade to try to, to flatten the T plus zero line as much as I possibly can, which, of course, will reduce the potential profit. But uh, uh, very often I'll essentially uh, be stopped out by doing that. But uh, I never complain about being stopped out with a profit. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so let's go run through an a example where the market was moving up. Make sure I got PowerPoint selected here. Okay, so this was a, a December expiration. Sorry, I need to update this header. Um, this started in October, and as we know, the uh, the market rallied pretty well. This is your typical entry, $6,400 in margin. And here's the chart, typical. And as you remember, the uh, the market did go up pretty well here. But you can see we have a nice large area to capture some profit. So after about a month, the SPX has gone up 100 points, and we're down just a little bit, you know, $90, which, you know, how can you complain after a 100-point move being down $90? So at this point, we're, we're going to uh, reverse Harvey some of those upper puts and raise that right side expiration up. Notice the margin did increase quite a bit, so it, it does increase your margin by doing the reverse Harvey, but uh, you need to do it if you want to raise that expiration up. And here's what that looks like. So um, one thing I noticed here was the one standard deviation was about where the long upper long was. So that might be a good clue of when you want to do a reverse Harvey and start raising that expiration side up on the right. And it's kind of hard to see those lines, so I zoomed in a bit. So you can see before and after that we did raise it above zero. So you're not going to lose anything as long as it stays, you know, in, on the upside. And then your profit zone, obviously, there's no risk on the upside, so you have lots and lots of room at this point. And then uh, the market did pull back a little bit. Uh, I think this was a 20-point uh, down day. So the volatility changed, and we ended up making 723 on this trade, which was 6%. But you can see it ended up just a little bit above the expiration break-even, and that's why you stay in this if, if you want to try and squeeze a little bit more out, because it can pull back like that and get above the expiration line. So that's a typical trade on the upside with a pretty strong move up. Now, the significant down move. Now, there's a... I guess that the big problem with this trade is if it moves down quickly after you put it on. So you now we had that big move in August. So this is actually, oh, I need to update this too. It's a, uh, what is the expiration? This must have been a October expiration. So we put it on here on August 11th. And then here's our profit zone. And then in 10 days later, the SPX is already down to 1989. We're down about $350. So here's what it looks like. So this, in this case, the price has moved quite a bit versus that other one that we saw where it moved about, about half this much. So now we're sitting well outside the tent. We're down a little bit, but hardly anything. Now, Dan, how, how often does this happen to you, and, and what's your typical reaction? Um. Yeah, I've only had this happen uh, once, I think. Obviously, you know, I've had several occasions, including one or two of, of the cycles that I currently have on where I'm at the the left side, uh, the left expiration break even. So that's fairly common. And as as you're going to show, usually I might have added a, a debit spread or something to kind of bring up that side a little bit, but I think it's very unusual for it just to completely blow through the tent, uh, you know, in a short period of time. And I, I think as you're going to discuss one option at that point, okay, you're down a couple hundred bucks, just, you know, take it off, you know, so what? You know, but if you're... Uh, but if you're ideologically opposed to doing that, 
you can do the steps that you're going to outline to bring up the left side of the t plus zero curve, make it nearly flat, and generally the market will come back, maybe not inside the tent, but it'll it'll get close to it, and you wind up with a profitable trade. Yeah, the only thing that scares me on moves that big that fast is they tend to uh, keep going. So, and that's uh, the reason why you have to make the T plus zero line nearly flat uh, to protect yourself in that unlikely event, and then you just take it off. And right, say, and, and this heck? teenies would really help you out. So this is uh, where you want those extra long puts. Right, and that is one of the reasons why I've started adding uh, teenies. Now, I will say that it is that it is not uncommon for uh, the trader to have been in the trade for, say, 30, 35, 40 days, and you're showing a good profit, but you have now moved to the, the left side of the tent or even beyond, and that is actually very common. Well, I wouldn't say very common, but, you know, fairly common. But usually you're up already, you know, 10, 15 percent. So then if you if you want to continue to track the trade, you can by, you know, bringing the left side up or just uh, take your money. And I have one of those on uh, right now where I have uh, blown outside uh, the left side of the tent, but I'm still up, I think, around 15 percent on that. Yeah, and you can see the uh, T plus 32 line here. If you were 30 days in the trade, it'd be a different discussion. Well, right. I mean, you know, what I used to find with, with my students when I was mentoring is that everybody seems to focus on on the expiration graph, but you really should be focusing on the day steps because that's where you can uh, better model your risk and your potential P&L. I think, Jim, didn't you tell me the uh, CEO of LiveAll was, didn't want to put the expiration lines on their charts because nobody ever trades for that? Yeah, they, 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 she did. She ended up saying that it was, um, it's a mirage, right, especially if you're looking at a butterfly. You're never, okay, going to end up uh, hitting the uh, peak. We used to end up joking that you got a better chance getting hit by lightning on the way to cashing in your Powerball <laughs> winning ticket than you do to land on top of that butterfly. Yep. Okay, so um, here we are in this trade. So we do have a few choices. We can just exit, and you know you're only down a few hundred, and the average win on this is higher. So you know exiting, there's no nothing wrong with that. You can reposition the trade. I added it with a teeny, but you could re do it without. It depends on how worried you are about a continued down move, and if we're in a sustained bear market, maybe that's not a bad idea. You could just buy a long put, um, add put debit spreads, and if you just think it's going to move a little bit, uh, add back spreads to protect the downside so you're getting net long puts, or I said buy a, a short combo trade, which is buy one put, and if you're in a PM account, you can maybe just sell a call, or Reg T, maybe uh, do a, a call credit spread to pay for it. So those are just some of the, the, the ideas that we can do. So exit the trade, obviously, there's no charts to go over for that. But if we could look at um, repositioning the trade with a teeny. So here we're just basically rolling it the whole thing down. So we're just taking the trade off, putting a new trade on, and adding an extra long put at, uh, I think, about a 10 delta. So we're just slightly negative delta. It does increase the margin a little bit. And uh, I just noted that the VIX was about 25 when we did this. So here's the before and after. So. You know, if you are worried about a big bear move down, having that extra long put does lift it up, and um, you know it it helps your gamma. So when you have vol increases, you don't get hurt as bad either. So that's what that one looks like. So here we go. We we had a crash on the 24. So at 10 a.m., this position was actually up $550, and that's what it looked like. The uh, you know the skews and everything, but. Um, Having that extra long put, basic. If I go back, you can see we paid thirteen dollars for it, and it's trading at fifty-two. And uh, you know those puts can really explode in value. And uh, don't underestimate how much the teenies can help. So, I know Jim, you had a um, a mutual friend of ours was trading a weirdor and had some teenies that basically turned a position profitable on a big move down last year, right? 
Well, not even last. Well, yes, I guess it is last year at this point. Um, yeah, you know who we're, we're talking about, Dan. Um, they had bought their teenies for um, about a buck, um, buck, between a buck fifteen and a buck seventy five. Uh, and um, when they sold uh, with that August um, sell-off, uh, they sold them for 50 bucks. So, you know, the thought is, yeah, you know a lot of them are going to be getting thrown away. Um, and as you said, you know, you're not giving up that much percentage on it. And for it to end up saving you when you have, when, you know, you blow through the downside of your butterfly or your, uh, or your weirdo or your Jeep, um, it, it helps a lot. Helps you sleep better I at would night. agree, Jim. Okay, so that's with the uh, um, with repositioning with a teeny. Here's just buying a long put. So all we did here is just we we bought a 11 delta put, and uh, again the margin's about the same as it was before. Notice the Vega is significantly lower, and uh, buying the put actually doesn't do a bad job. So here's the before and after. You know it flattens you out pretty well, but your your Vega is in much better shape for when it does crash. You're not going to get hurt as much as if you're, you know, have that. What is it? 192 negative Vega. So here we go with the crash. This actually uh, did pretty well again. You know, here's our $14 put selling for 54 almost, and we're only down 50 bucks. And I think a lot of traders would be awfully happy being down $50 on that kind of move. So that's what that position looked like. So here's the one where we add some put debit spreads. Now this is okay if it's going to move a little bit. It doesn't really help quite as much on a big crash. Uh, the margin's about the same. We're still pretty good with the negative Vega. We are slightly delta negative, but it o it's only going to help so much. And here's what the um, with and without the hedge looks like. And you can see even with the hedge, it's still tailing off here. And here we go with the crash. The, the vols just exploded. We were, I think, let me go back and see what the vols were. So we're at 15, 16 vols up here, and now we're at 25, 26, and this position just gets crushed. And here it is um, visually what it looks like. So again, those put debit spreads are okay to a point, but if it's a massive move like that, it's probably not going to be what you need to help you. Uh, a put back, back spreads, not a bad alternative. Um, it, it did significantly increase the margin for Reg T. Portfolio margin, probably not, but Reg T definitely. It does turn it to a nice positive Vega, and you are negative theta, so you've introduced a pretty good sized sea of death. And what that looks like is this. So we do have a sea of death, so this is a good short term hedge, but you know, you're not going to leave it here. If it, it, goes down here and stops, you know, your, va your theta is going to be pretty negative. So this is a, a short-term solution. And after the crash, this was down uh, up about $600. And again, you know, you're net long put, so it makes sense that you'd be up. And this is what that looks like after the crash. Um, another one is buy a put combo. So here we are, one long put, and we sold two call um, credit spreads to pay for it, and um, the, the net price is about the same, and the margin goes up quite a bit. Not as much as the uh, back spread, but it does cut the theta, or the vega, and does give us nice negative delta, and we're net long uh, put on the downside. So here's the before and after. Now the problem with this trade is if this adjustment, if the market doesn't crash and it reverses on you, now you're, you're giving up probably more than you want to give up. But if it does crash like you think it does, it does a good job of protecting you. So you do end up, in, in this case, with a slight profit, $450, and it looked like this. Again, the problem with this is um, if it goes against you, you're, you're sloping down to the right pretty well. So that's um, those are the kind of the, the examples I went through. So just a summary. My personal preference is exit the trade. There's enough of these that you put on every year that you know, if you're down a few hundred dollars, it's uh, not a big deal to make that back. You can reposition the trade with a teeny, which is another uh, excellent alternative, um, or buy a long put. Um, the put's probably going to uh, start costing you money, so this isn't really a, an adjustment you want to keep on a long time because of the negative theta. But if you're worried about the next few days, then buying a long put's not a bad idea. The put debit spread, again, it's, it's not... 
the best solution for a large move down, but it's good if the market's kind of stabilizing. And then you have the back spreads, which with the margin problem, but does a good job on the, the downside. And then the combo trade is okay, except uh, you have to watch out for the market whipsawing and um, costing you money on the way back up. So in summary, uh, after a large move down, there's a high chance the market will continue moving in that direction. Uh, reducing vega or making it positive helps if the market continues lower. Getting slightly delta negative also helps. Um, don't stay out of, outside of the tent on the downside too long. And I think that's probably just a good rule of thumb. If the market doesn't come back, don't fight it, just exit. Um, if you have a profit or break even after a large move, it's probably uh, prudent to exit that trade at that point. And that's it for the presentation. Um, let me uh, go to the chat. I'm sure we have some questions. Tom, that was an excellent uh, presentation. I mean, you uh, totally captured the essence of this particular uh, strategy. And uh, you even threw in a couple of uh, great ideas that, that I hadn't uh, thought about, you know, regarding the the downside adjustments, I would agree exactly with what you said. You know, the combo will work for an immediate fix, but but then you have to sit on the trade. So I don't I don't like to have to sit on the trade on any kind of trade. Um, and what you said about uh, buying a long put at that uh, point in time, it's probably too late because the long put is going to be really expensive. So what I do anyway. Not that, not that each of these adjustments will not work in the right context because they will, but my two preferences are number one, exit, and number two, uh, buy enough debit spreads, usually two or three, to really flatten out the T plus zero and then uh, put in a contingent order, good till canceled, to take those debit spreads out at about you know, 50% loss, and if that happens, the trade will still uh, probably, usually, does make money. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Um, let's see, uh, we had a, looks like quite a few questions. So, uh, Manju asks, how many teenies per tranche of six butterflies? I think typically one is all you need. I don't think yeah, you need one, yeah, one for five or six. If you have a 10 lot, I'd put on two. Um, I, I uh, put on some nine lots this morning. I still, uh, uh, and I did add only one teeny, but you could buy two if you want to. No, I take that. No, I'm sorry. I did buy two at at about a buck and a half. Okay. And for um, a nine lot, that's that's going to be negligible. And Timo asked, are the teenies with the same expiration? I, think, I would think normally, but that would also be a, an alternative that you could do is do the teenies in a, a shorter expiry so they'd be a bit cheaper. Uh, you can. And, uh, you know, really there is so much flexibility in this strategy, at least I think, that, that many of these um, things we discussed are traders of choice. Now, you know, for myself, yeah, I was looking for a trade, you know, hence the name that I didn't have to look at every day and maybe maybe once a week in the first, um, you know, 30 days or so. So my primary motivation was to come up with something that I really didn't need to do much. So the more that you that you add to this. It's like if you're uh, cooking a, a fancy meal as opposed to making a sandwich. If you have a fancy meal, you got to stay by the stove. Well put. Uh, let's see. Tom Henley said when you do the reverse Harvey, won't that increase the margin? I think typically it decreases the margin. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on... Well, I guess if you're doing one leg, it'll increase it. If you're doing both, it should decrease it. If you're doing both, it will decrease it. If you only do the upside, it will increase it, but again, not much when you consider the potential return of this uh, trade on a yield basis. You know, even if you factor in uh, the additional margin for the denominator, you, you're still likely to have a very good return.
what I really like about the, this uh, trade, in addition to um, to almost being an ATM machine, is that I sleep a lot better with this trade because I know that even in a you know god awful down move, not much is going to happen. Like you know, for example, today I didn't do anything uh, when we had the uh, 400 and 50 point uh, Dow down move a couple, you know, two or three days ago, Monday, I guess it was. I think I added one debit spread. That was all I did on any of them. And in fact, I finished that day. They were all profitable. So I really sleep very well on this. And the only thing is that as you're getting closer to expiration, don't try to fight this too much. If you have a, a, a nice a profit, you know, 15, 20 percent, we'll say, and it looks as if you're going to have to fight it, then just, you know, take your money because there will be another one right around the corner. Hey, Dan, um, I have a question on this, though. Do you, when the IV is very low, um, you tend to end up having to pay more for those puts further below the money. Do you still use broken wings if the put skew becomes steep in low IV environments? Yeah, the low IV environment is somewhat problematic, and and you're exactly right on that. Um, I, I, you can uh, fudge with this a little bit in that situation. In other words, the the uh, 40 on the upside and 50 on the downside are not really set in stone. You might want to fudge that a little bit, but alternatively, you can look at it from the point of view that. Um, you know, some cycles I'll make more and some I'll make a little less. And so it's, uh, you know, again, a trader's choice. What, what, what I found was that, um, you know, if the IVs are, you know, average or above um, and the put skews tend to be a little bit flatter, I really like, and, I, and that's what I do in my Kevlar, right? I'll always use broken wings when, when that's the case. But if the IV is, is lower, um, I tend to end up using more symmetrical butterflies and then doing the more, um, you know, traditional using a call below the money to kind of end up uh, balancing out my, my deltas. Because obviously, if you use a regular butterfly, it's going to have lower deltas than the broken wing butterfly. By moving that long foot further down, it ends up that that is your adjustment for your deltas. Right. Yeah, that is a good approach. Uh, some more questions. Uh, Rick says, can also close a put debit spread or raise the T plus zero line if above the tent? Um, well, if you're above the tent, you probably don't have a put debit spread on except just the one that's embedded in the, the original butterfly. Yeah, if you have already added one at that, I mean, let's say the market has made a swing down uh, and you added a debit spread, and now it the completely rallies, and you have a monster rally, and now you're on the the outside of the tent on the right side. That a debit spread uh, probably should have been long gone at that point. So, so if you're going to use uh, debit spreads, I recommend putting in a good till canceled uh, type of order to take it out. You go ahead and calculate the approximate. Uh, price and uh, trigger point, uh, you know, at which that contingent order would fire, and then you don't have to worry about the debit spread and don't even have to think about it because you know it will be taken out. Yeah, that's a really important note. I just want to make sure everybody, you know, because I, we don't know who, what system everybody trades on. Um, what Dan's talking about is, is a contingent order that only gets triggered once your price gets to where it is then the order goes in. Uh, if you don't end up having a trigger point, it'll get executed pretty much right away. Um, and Mark asks, uh, could you explain what reverse Harvey is? I've, I've done a presentation on it, Mark, and uh, there's a blog article about it, but essentially you're just rolling the long puts towards the short, towards you're, you're reducing the, the width of the strikes on the butterfly. Right. You're narrowing the butterfly, which takes a lot of the risk off the table. Correct. And then Bob Hogg asks, at what volatility calculation mode do you set TOS to display? Well, I use IB. I don't use TOS, so I just use Option View Greeks, Bob. 
And um, let's see, so every uh, okay, we put the trade on every other week, yes. Yeah? So six lots on every two weeks, correct? And um, I think you can do more than six. Six isn't a magic number. I do 15, 20 lots, so it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And weekly options, there's enough volatility with SPX to get those filled. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then uh, Rick says, nice thing about SPX weeklies is you have Friday p.m. settlement. So if you want to go into settlement, you're not going to have any surprises. And let's see what else. Days and trade, we did that. Okay, so Scott Hanna says the plan capital number does not seem to incorporate the margin increase when you do the reverse Harvey. Um, yeah, you could uh, increase that plan capital. Uh, I think what, what was the reverse Harvey plan capital it was up around 11,000. And then uh, Rich said, uh, was this with or, with or without a teeny? Most of those I did were without teenies. But in this uh, market environment with the VIX where it is and the market looking like it wants to go lower, a teeny is not a bad thing to put on. Okay, and then uh, another question. Do you ever enter in a really low vol environment like in 2013 when it's really hard to get up to the right side, or the right side profitable? What do you think about these trades in low vol environments? That was the question that I ended up asking uh, Dan a little while ago. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're going to be like a weird door, um, you know, in the sense that they will work, but you won't make as much money. And you just have to decide if if you want to uh, choose another strategy at that uh, point. Maybe, you know, maybe you're a really good uh, calendar trader. Basically, I suck at calendars, so... That's not even a consideration for me, but in a low vol environment, if you wanted to play with the calendar or if you wanted to, uh, uh, you know, do some volatility uh, plays, that, that would be, you know, something to consider because you won't make as much money on these. They should still be profitable, though. Dan, when it comes to this, you know, and same thing with with the weird ores, okay, or, or these things. Uh, you know, one of the debates that uh, you know I, I see, I have, I know a lot of people have. It's the concept of uh, putting on a lot of small trades. And uh, what did you say you had six of them open right now? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think I right. have either five or six of them open. Yeah. Versus having one open or two open, you know, because the way I kind of take a look at it, if you're making thirty percent. Uh, on average on each of these, but you have six of them open, that means um, you have to end up uh, having six trades where you're there versus if you had one trade uh, to make 30%. So uh, th there's a variance. One, what made you lean towards doing these pieces no, versus it, a monthly basis? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, not 30% uh, for all six of them. I mean, I'm looking... You know, I'm looking to make, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent on each one of them. So, okay. uh, so the reason that I that I don't uh, put uh, one on for for one, you know, one per month is that I'm looking to take advantage of market movement as it happens such that, you know, every single one that I launch for that moment in time is going to be perfectly positioned. And what yeah. I have found you know, what is are the that, do that, 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 that I was going to just comment on um, it, how you evaluate the fact that it's a very different trade with 70 days left to go versus with 21 days left to go. Uh, yeah. And, and so um, I will get out of these, you know, whenever I have a pretty good profit, I either get out, or I uh, flatten both sides of the T plus zero line uh, such that I don't have to worry about it, and I may try to squeeze out another couple hundred and then take it off. And um, I, I'm not averse to taking these off, you know, long before the uh, 10 to 14 days, you know, if I have a pretty good profit. I just take it off, and then I have no risk. And... Uh, um, uh, so I think that's a critical, and I think that also it's important to remember, and 
and you and, and uh, Tom and all the experienced uh, traders out there know this, that the closer you get to the expiration of that particular cycle, uh, the more difficult or maybe not difficult, the more problematic it's going to be to get this trade off. So you may not be able to exit this trade as a butterfly. So that frequently happens, and I just exit it as verticals. You know, I'll go back and forth from one side or the other, you know, until I have the trade off. What I do when I'm nicely profitable, which I mean, which by that I mean in the 20 to 25 percent range, I will put in a good till canceled order to uh, take off the entire butterfly at a uh, profitable price, which I've already calculated that's going to preserve the profit I've already made. And I'll leave that in for a couple of days and see if somebody fills it. Sometimes they do. And I get the whole thing off at that time. But if I'm approaching expiration, uh, I'm not going to wait around to try to do that. I'm going to get it off. If I have to take it off as a verticals, I'll get it off. You know, there were some really good points, there, and I hope people end up understanding some of the nuances that you made. You know, you and I have talked about this. Sometimes in the market, people say, oh, I got terrible fills. Well, you got terrible fills on a butterfly. You know, break it down into verticals, break it down into smaller pieces, and you can end up getting at the trade. Now, granted, you have some leg risk, but that's where the experience comes into trading this. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, another like interesting it. thing I've done is um, if you get your butterfly deep in the money, sometimes it gets hard to fill with those you know larger prices on the puts. Mm -hmm. So if you sell the butterfly on the calls that, that are out of the money that are a lot cheaper, sometimes you can get that filled and synthetically sell your butterfly. So you have your long puts and your short uh, call butterflies. They cancel each other out, and sometimes it's easier to get filled on the call butterflies if it's out of the money. Yeah, they call that a box. Exactly. So you're creating synthetic long and short stock positions that offset each other. But uh, What happens when it's deep in the money, um, the bid-ask spreads are so wide uh, that um, sometimes if there's smaller trades in between the bid-ask, it can really vary the price of what you're seeing as a mid-price. Uh, you know, if there's a two or three dollar difference which there frequently is okay between a bid and ask okay deep in the money um you're going to have a lot more variance in what what you think the real mid price is versus if it's out of the money where there's typically you know um you know 20 to let's say uh, you know 60 or 80 cents okay between the bid ask spread Now, let's see, a couple of people asked if this is going to be archived, and yes, it will be in the library, and I will put the slides in there. Um, let's see, there's a lot of questions. I'm just trying to see if there's some we haven't filled. Uh, let's see, okay, Ken asked, are fills pretty good at the mid? I've found I can get filled pretty close to the mid most of the time. How about you, Dan? Yeah, generally speaking, you know, particularly, I mean, what, what I'll often do is, um, uh, say I'm going to have, uh, for example, a nine lot, which, you know, nine, eighteen, nine. I'll start by, uh, you know, putting in an order for a one or two lot, and maybe bump that up a nickel, you know, baiting the hook until I see what they're going to take. If they don't take it at all, I'm not going to uh, force that trade. But, for example, I put on the March 4 cycle this morning. Um, I already have the March 3 cycle, which is the regular monthly, but um, I, I went in to think or swim and, and look to see if I could get a good price on the March 4, and indeed I could. So I decided to, to add that one on. So I have uh, those two trades are only one week apart, but they're different strikes. So this is not a problem, and both of them are doing great. But I just now put on the March 4 this morning. But anyway, uh, I started out, uh, I looked to see what their mid was. I put in order for, I think it was a two lot, to try to get that filled at the mid. They wouldn't take it at 45 cents. Uh, no, actually, the, bid at that t the mid at that time was only 40 cents. Um, so I bumped that up a nickel. They didn't take it at 45. I bumped it up. Uh, one more nickel, and they immediately took it. 
So then I filled the rest of that nine lot in one account, and then I did the exact same thing in the other account that I trade with another nine lot, and I got them all filled at 50 cents. I see someone ask if I will <laughs> if I will have a service for some. <laughs> I'm I, 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 my friend. I would like to to help you, but there's not enough money for me to do that at at my age. There's no way I would ever do that again. Sorry, but you know you don't need a service because this presentation basically has all the information you would ever need to trade this trade all by yourself. And if there's a demand for it, we can probably uh, come up with something, and I can run it, but. Um, like like you said, Dan, um, it's a fairly simple trade, so you should be able to get everything you need out of this. Um, Stephen asked, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of entering every week? Have you thought you about that? You can enter this every week if you want to. Uh, yeah. I usually shoot for every two weeks, but I will take advantage of an opportunity like I had today to get one cheaply. Again, remember that in the context of a 70-day a, a, a uh, trade horizon versus a 75-day uh, trade horizon, that's negligible. So if you can get a good one uh, cheaply, then just go ahead and take it. Yeah, I got some on Monday for $0.35, cents, believe it or not. Wow. Now, that's – I've never gotten one. I've gotten several at 60 65 I've never gotten one for, for $0.35. Cents. That That's incredible, Tom. Well, the ball was pretty high, so yeah. – Monday was I think the force was with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Duke asked how many debit spreads per six lot with a good to cancel order. I think uh, normally you do about two, right? Yeah, generally. Again, it depends on, on where I am in the life of the trade. It depends on what my P&L is. Uh, but if I really need to make the – but if I've made the decision that I'm profitable in the trade, but I think – that the market is going to come back a little bit, which is a guess, of course, and I want to, you know, stick around to get another two, three, four hundred dollars. I'm going to concentrate on on uh, flattening the left side of the T plus zero curve. Now, in so doing, of course, you will drop the right side of the T plus zero curve. So you don't want to stay in that trade forever, but if but, you know, if you can stay in another two or three days and make a few more hundred dollars, then just go ahead and exit everything. So uh, usually it's uh, two, but it might be a three and it might be one. It all depends on where I am in the life of the trade and with the, uh, and with the profits that I've already accrued. I think uh, there's still quite a few questions, and I know, Dan, you've got to get going pretty soon. So how about if I copy all the questions and uh, put them all together in an email to you? We can get them answered and post them in the forums. Okay. I don't want to go over too long because everybody's uh, busy too, but there's so many questions here. It's probably going to take uh, I don't know how long to answer, but um, probably another 45 minutes if I – with all the questions in here. So why don't we just uh, wrap it up now. I'll, uh, again, get the questions compiled, and we'll go through them and answer them and post them in the forums. And I uh, really want to appreciate uh, you, Dan, for taking the time to join us and share your experience trading this live. It's really a great trade, and uh, it's, it's something I think everybody should have in their portfolio. Well, thanks a lot, Tom, for doing a great job. You put this together much better than I could have, and thanks a lot. Okay, and thanks, Jim, too, for joining, and uh, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Jim. No, it was great talking to you again, Dan. Oh, you bet. Okay, so thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your sticking around with us, and we will see you next time, and have a great 2016. Take care, all. Bye-bye now. Bye.